Hey, it's Sheila Social Studies. Hey guys, welcome back to Sheila Social Studies. All right, so we covered a brief introduction of the Industrial Revolution. Now let's get into really some of inventors and some of their effects on the Industrial Revolution. As you remember, like I said, the first breakthrough of the Industrial Revolution, early 1700s, came from Great Britain. Okay, and it was in the textile industry or the way cloth goods were being made. Uh, Richard Arkwright, uh, Arkwright, an Englishman who invented what we call the spinning machine in 1769, he called it the water frame, which replaced hand spinning. Uh, there's a picture of it on the right. Women used to be able to take this cotton and spin it, and they used to make a thread out of it. Uh, the unfortunate thing is when women used to do it by hand, they might only be able to make one thread at a time. And if you make one thread at a time to make a shirt, it's going to take you a long time to make a shirt or a blanket or pants or something like that. Well, this water frame, which used flowing water, remember what we said at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, water sources, rivers, streams were the main form of power. They would use that power, which this water frame would then spin right using the 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 water source uh, and those gears and it would spin and it would maybe ma now make dozens of cotton threads at the same time rather than one so remember what we said about the industrial revolution mechanization machines and producing things faster cheaper and more efficient so what does it do for the sale of or textile goods well first of all it makes cotton production faster and more efficient which leads to a cheaper price of goods. So many of these textile mills, you remember, are built by rivers and streams. And Great Britain at this point in time, in its late 1760s, is really becoming the most uh, productive textile manufacturing industry in the world. And they're actually, uh, they start using American cotton. Okay, so now southern raw good getting sent over to Britain to be processed and sent back to America as processed goods. Well, now America, remember we had that Embargo Act, the Non-Intercourse Act, the War of 1812, stuff like that. So, like, America is sitting here now, and we want to sit here and start really making our own goods. So this guy right here, Samuel Slater, actually drafts a design of one of those uh, spinning wheels and brings it over to the United States and really starts the textile mill manufacturing in America here in uh, the New England area or the, yeah, the, the blue area on that map. So the textile industry really blows up. You have the Lowell Mill Girls, Massachusetts. I mean, you have really a lot of textiles now in America. So what we do is we take the raw cotton from the South, transport it to the New England area, or the Northeastern part of the United States, and they process it, turn it into something and go ahead and, and trade it back or sell it back. Okay. So this is where it really starts. The textile industry, the, um, the revolution, uh, the industrial revolution starts in textiles, but why, why stop there? Right. And we'll get into that in a second. But the biggest effect on the world, especially the United States, is this invention right here, right? Where this slide is going to cover Eli Whitney. And up until Eli Whitney, slavery was on a decline. One slave working 10 to 12 hours a day can produce about one to two pounds of cotton. Slave owners are like, this, this is, I'm not making that much money. I'm not producing that much cotton. I need to do something else. Eli Whitney says, hmm. What's the problem with the cotton? Oh, it's taking the seeds out? That's what's taking you a long time? Well, I'm going to invent a machine, and he calls it the cotton gin. And this machine is going to rake the seeds out of the cotton, uh, which, which makes it a more efficient process, a faster process, faster, cheaper, more efficient. Remember those three words. So if I can process this quicker, hmm. You would think you don't need as many slaves. If one slave did two pounds in 10 hours and the cotton gin made it so two slaves can do 50, 100 pounds in 10 hours, you shouldn't need as many slaves because you're processing it much faster. However, because of the cotton gin, slave owners stopped making or stopped planting everything else and only started to plant cotton. So actually these plantations became huge plantations of just cotton. So now in effect, they actually needed more slaves. So now the, ex the expansion of cotton production in the South blew up. 
Okay, so we covered this before as well. United States factories needed better technology or tools to manufacture muskets. Enter Eli Whitney again, his idea of interchangeable parts. Remember how I said in that last one, if you were firing a musket and that little pin broke and you needed to replace it, you could just throw that pin away, take one of those interchangeable parts, those interchangeable pins and put it on there and screw it on and keep firing away until maybe it broke again. The same idea for the muskets and that's a broken down musket right there using interchangeable parts. The same idea of the musket got put into factory machines. Okay, so if you built this whole factory machine and it broke and you didn't have an interchangeable part, you'd have to trash that machine. But now if you have these big machines that are cranking out goods and a piece breaks, you take an interchangeable part, stick it in there, get that machine up and running a lot faster, this is why the Industrial Revolution makes the idea of mass production available uh, or makes it a reality. Uh, and it makes goods faster, cheaper, more efficient, and mass production. That's what it is, mechanization. So Eli Whitney is not the only one who has a large effect. 1831, Cyrus McCormick develops what we call a mechanical reaper to uh, quickly and efficiently harvest wheat. So you can, if you can harvest it quickly and more efficiently, what do you think happens to the price of it? Sure, it'll go down, right? He uses a, a new tactic called credit to be able to encourage sales. He advertises. He actually offers repairs and broken and spare parts for broken pieces on his machines. So that industry goes up. If you can harvest wheat a lot faster, you can feed a lot more people populations will go up okay in 1837 john deere farmers getting upset with these cheap iron soft brittle plows that just keep busting on rocks he says hmm i'm gonna make one out of steel and he will make a steel plow which will just crush right through all that stuff so these inventions really lead on to another agricultural revolution. The first type of agricultural revolution, right, is farming, learning how to farm. Then farming with, you know, machines that are, or not machines, but, but hand tools and tools that were able to be pulled by oxen and such so you can farm. But now you're getting farming, you're farming a whole lot faster. So now you can have these huge crops, these huge yields of crops because you're making things faster, cheaper, and more efficient. All right. So after that, we have now the idea of uh, these factories. Now, now this is where factories are really going to start coming into play here. This is what you have to start thinking about. With the invention of steam power, you have a boiler filled with water. You light a fire underneath it. The steam gets forced out, and that is what now will turn your gears. It no longer has to be a slow water source. With that idea of steam power and steam power engines, factories don't have to be located on the water anymore. They can move into cities or closer to cities and transportation centers. So that means now cities will become the center of uh, industrial growth, no longer by the rivers where you can have one factory every little bit, a couple miles down the river. Now you can have a couple of factories in the same area. So a lot of these people are moving from the farmlands into cities so they can work at these factory jobs. There's no skill needed. Right? You could just stand there and press a button to make a machine work. Boop, thunk, boop, thunk, boop, thunk. I could do it with the other hand. Boop, thunk. Right? So there's no skill needed. So now people are just flocking into cities. Buildings are being built. They're becoming the epicenters of filth, overcrowding, sewer problems, pollution problems, disease is spreading a lot faster. So city life, this is where city life really starts to take a turn for the worse. Factories, like I said exploding up we today are a service industry factory industry led our economy for hundreds of years okay so we have this factory economy factories are growing up people are flocking to work them the working conditions are getting bad big gears are turning larry sticks his hand in there chops his hand off oh well hire another larry jerry sticks his leg in there gets his leg chopped off Bo died on the machine the other day it's terrible Employees are working 12, 14 hours, 16 hours a day, unhealthy conditions. They can't breathe the stagnant, stale air or that's full of all the soot and steam and everything like that. They have all these issues in these factories going on. In OSHA, there's no safety uh, administration. It, it, it's just really killing these factory workers. Craftsmen, 
Their wages are dipping uh, because of this non-skilled labor. And and the reason why this kind of happens is, you know, remember that story about that widget? I can make a widget in two days. I could sell it for 20 bucks, right? I had a skill, so I got paid quite a few dollars. But now with this industry and these factories making that same widget for a dollar, you don't need a lot of pay, right? You got guys just pressing buttons, so there's no skill factory labor. Cheap labor, you're making things faster, cheaper, more efficient. My salary is going down because I can't sell it for $15 anymore because the factory is selling it for a dollar. So lots of people will actually start losing skills to be able to take these factory jobs. So because Larry lost his hand, Jerry lost his leg, and Bo died on the machine the other day, uh, workers needed to do something. And what they did in response was they created labor unions or trade unions. What happens is these craftsmen or these factory workers would get together and they, well, they wouldn't get together, but craftsmen would get together and fight for their rights for higher wages and better working conditions. Factory uh, workers would also form them for the, quite the same thing, higher wages and better working conditions. Uh, they would do things like protest and they would strike and they would refuse to work until employee met their demands. And there's a big fist there and that's a good sign for a labor union because I want you to think about it like this right if somebody was poking you right in the cheek with one finger that's annoying but it doesn't hurt very much but if you got a whole bunch of fingers and put them together and started poking that would hurt a lot that's the idea behind a labor union i go to the boss and say hey boss i want to raise he says you're fired but if i get everybody on the floor all 150 of us to the boss and say hey give us each an extra penny per hour or we quit right one of these strikes we're going to stop working so you stop making money if you don't make money you're mad we want more money, give us more money, we'll get back to work. So that was the idea behind labor unions. And there was some success in some labor unions. Sarah Bagley became a union leader in Massachusetts with some success. Uh, her union campaigned to reduce the 12 to 14 hour day to 10 hour working days. Some states were to pass the 10 hour working days, but others did not. So the union got some victories. Other states would, uh, would still let child labor prevail because you can pay children a lot cheaper and the long work day remained. You have to remember about these work days. These people went to work in the morning. They might have had breakfast at home. They didn't have lunch at work and they might eat a cracker or something like that and then go home for dinner. Okay, so this is the type of things that's going on with the factories now. You have all these inventors with all these effects that are going on and a lot of these effects are negative really when you think about it. Positive, faster, cheaper, more efficient, but negative slavery explodes because of the cotton gin all right so these are some inventors some effects labor unions that affect the factories the factories are moving from rivers to, to cities now and that really starts to have effect on the whole history of the united states